ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us here in our AEI headquarters on this beautiful fall day. Thank you as well to our television audience and our online audience. I'm Nick Eberstadt, the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy here at AEI and author of this book, Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. My colleague here is David Wessel, director of Brookings Institution's Hutchins Center for Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Uh, David and I are gonna try something a little bit different today. David's gonna be the MC of our event today. Uh, we'll see how this experiment and process uh, unfolds uh, with you here. Uh, David, do you want to uh, take over the notional baton now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I thought it's usual that the MC starts for, talks first, though. So oh. I'm like, well, <laughs> AEI rules. <laughs> AEI rules. Well, uh, you know, uh, we want to welcome AEI to the neighborhood. Thank As you. one of my colleagues says, we can now say that on Massachusetts Avenue, at least, AEI is to the left of Brookings. <laughs> 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 um, I, I'm I'm really glad that that Nick has done this book because. I think that uh, the acute issues of the Great Recession have, to a large extent, not completely passed. And what we're now observing is a number of chronic conditions, which, as Nick book shows, this one, the shocking uh, fraction of prime age men who are not working, is something that pre is a pre-existing condition, something that preceded the Great Recession, maybe gotten a little worse during the Great Recession. And so it requires something more than only, uh, and we could probably talk a little bit thus, uh, uh, something to make the economy grow faster. Nick's going to talk for a few minutes, and then I have a couple of slides in response, and then we're going to chat, and then we'll bring you into the conversation. I should mention that if you're watching online, uh, we're able to field questions. You go to a website called sli.do, sli.do, and you enter a code, AEI event. You just write your name, type in your question, and if we get to it, we'll, I'll pose it to Nick. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm going to try to discipline myself, and I expect you to discipline me if I don't discipline myself. It's a deal. To, okay, great. Uh, I promise. Uh, my book in uh, 10 minutes or less. Okay. So things haven't been going so well in U.S. labor markets since the turn of the century. Uh, the Employment to population ratio, the work rate for Americans 20 and older peaked around the turn of the century, and they have dropped in what I would regard as a dire manner, uh, as I show in this chart. This is men and women together since the year 2000. Um, what I point out in my book is that this decline of work rates for men has been going on for a long time. It has been going on for at least 50 years. The lower line is the work rate for men over the age of 20. You can say, wait a minute, Eberstadt, that includes population aging, and you'd be right about that. But the gray line is the prime working age men, the key 25 to 54 group. No aging effects there. And you can see that's been stumbling downwards for half a century. Here's another way of looking at that prime working age uh, men employment problem. This is the proportion of non-working men of prime ages from the beginning of the post-war era to the present. You can see this uh, eerie ratcheting up with every recession going to a new worse normal. Uh, right now, almost 15% of prime age guys have no paid employment. If you want to compare it to the Depression, you can, and it's not a happy comparison. Um, if we look at the work rates for prime age men in 2015, they were actually about two percentage points lower than for prime age men in 1940, at the tail end of the Depression. If you look at the group 20 to 64 years old, it likewise looks worse today than at the tail end of the Depression. So it's not wrong to describe the male work problem as being as if, as if depression, uh, depression scale. 
And in fact, if we just had American men back to work rates of 1965, there'd be about another almost 10 million guys with paid work in America today. Think how much different our country would be with that. So the main reason for this collapse, and I'd call it a collapse of work rates for men, has been declining labor force participation, has been the withdrawal of men from the workforce. We like to measure unemployment, but looking at unemployment is a very incomplete measure of what's going on. Uh, unemployed guys are the blue line here. Guys who have checked out of the workforce are the gray line. Today, there are over three times as many men who have left the workforce altogether as who are unemployed, without a job and looking for work. So this exit from the workforce dominates the male lack of work problem today. Um, this kind of crazy Mondrian chart is meant to show how the U.S. looks in international comparison, and it's not a happy story. We're the dark uh, black dashed line. You can see that we have kind of won the race to the bottom. Uh, actually, the drop in male labor force participation in America has been worse than in countries like Greece or in France or in countries that have had a sort of a lost generation of economic growth like Japan. Uh, we have the dubious distinction of winning this race, I'm afraid. Um, this chart you probably won't be able to see. You may have to go into the book. Uh, Amazon.com, thank you, St. Amazon. Um, what it shows is that men who are out of the labor force, by and large, are checked out of uh, civil society. They don't do civil society. About a tenth of them are adult students trying to get back into the game. Their, work uh, their time patterns are very much like employed men. For the rest of the group, the NEET, N-E-E-T, neither employed nor in education or training, uh, there's less civil participation, less volunteering, uh, less charity work uh, than working men or women or unemployed men. Uh, likewise with childcare and care for others, likewise with housekeeping. Their full-time job, the NEET men, uh, is watching, is television, video, um, internet, and the like, over 2,000 hours a year. Not the best way to get back into the game of employment as far as skill generation is concerned. Um, so what are the reasons for this uh, quiet catastrophe? And I think we can call it a quiet catastrophe. Um, clearly, there are three different sets of factors. We can say supply, demand, institutional or we can say economic and structural, um, uh, welfare related, and uh, barriers to employment. Uh, obviously, the big changes in the economy have had a major role in this story, but I think it's also possible to overstate the role of structural changes. Um, what I show here in this, uh, in this graph is the rising proportion of men not in the workforce in this prime age group. It's almost a straight line from 1965 to the present. If you took, at this, took a look at this line, you couldn't tell when the recessions were. You couldn't tell when the boom times were or when the bust times were. It's almost as if it's like an astronomical gravitational change. Um, we can also see other curious uh, differences in the, uh, in the labor force participation rates if we parse this out. We all know, for example, that uh, less educated men have been much more hard hit than more educated men. But I've uh, disaggregated here. The blue line and the gray line are both men without high school education, but the blue line are foreign born and the gray line is native born American men. The bottom has fallen out for native born American men without high school degrees. Foreign-born American, uh, foreign-born uh, college dropouts in the United States have about the same labor force profile as college grads in the United States. Um, one other curious thing to note, um, we have really big regional disparities in our labor force participation rates. And some of the big disparities are between neighboring states. Uh, Maine has got one of the poorest profiles. New Hampshire has one of the best profiles. There's only one state-by-state state border between Maine and New Hampshire. <laughs> They're together. 
uh, we've seen increasing disparities by state grow over time. It's a curious thing. Um, I wanted to point to the question of disability benefits. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion of disability benefits and uh, quite a bit also of disagreement about the role of uh, disability programs in this flight from work. Nobody can prove that disability programs have created this problem. Nobody can show that they have caused it. What I try to show in my book is that disability programs have a role in financing this phenomenon and that they have had a growing role in financing this phenomenon. Indeed, in 2013, by my estimates in this book, uh, almost three in five non, um, NILF men, not in labor force men, were receiving one or more disability benefit. About a million of the seven million were receiving two or more disability benefits, and about two-thirds were in households that had at least one disability benefit. Finally, there's the question of crime. Uh, this has been uh, all too largely overlooked as a uh, problem with respect to the uh, men without work phenomenon. Uh, since the uh, since the 1980s, we've seen an explosion in the number of Americans who have a felony in their background, now over 20 million, one in eight men. Uh, this is surely part of the problem, but we don't collect figures very well on this aspect. In my book, I show that irregardless of age, irregardless of ethnicity, irregardless of education, guys who have a prison record are much more likely to be out of the labor force than guys who have just an arrest record, who in turn are much more likely to be out of the labor force than guys who don't have any record of trouble with the law. I can't tell you about the dynamics here because shamefully our government does not collect statistics on this critical aspect of modern American society. Uh, but these factors all have to do with the terribly worrisome growth in non-working male Americans in our post-war era. Thank you. Ten minutes? Great. Excellent. Very disappointing. Um, so if I go, ah. um, so I'm, I, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm, I think it's really important that Nick is calling attention to this issue and doing so as effectively as he has already, uh, which of course is his trademark. I just want to note for the record that I noticed this too. Uh, Nick, Nick says no one was paying attention. This happens to be the last story I did for the front page of the Wall Street Journal in 2014. And it was a, a remark, it was a very moving experience um, to talk to guys who were in this category. These prime age men, mostly too old to be in college, mostly too young to be retired in our conventional sense. Um, this is uh, uh, a guy named Mark Riley from Little Rock. And I asked him, what did he do every day? And he said that the most meaningful day of his week was working at this food bank. It's an unusual food bank, Little Rock, as you can see, they give out fresh fruit and vegetables. And he said it gave some order to his life. It made him realize there were people who were worse off than him. And he got the leftovers. Uh, um, I want to. Uh, I want to make two. I want. I want to make two points. Uh, kind of. Um, a bit in the weeds about what Nick said. So first of all, as Nick and I will talk about, there's a, I think, a widespread agreement that this is a problem. Uh, Jason Furman at the Council of Economic Advisors did a report paper. that coincides Excellent. with the publication of Nick's book. <coughs> um, where there's a disagreement is about what is the nature of the cause. How much of this is supply, that is something about the men that leads them not to be interested or willing or capable of working? And how much is about the demand? How much do employers want them? And when you look at Nick's charts, <coughs> he's right, you can draw a line, but you also see a lot of ups and downs. And in fact, recently, over the last 12 months, the labor force participation rate for men in this age bracket has risen by about one percentage point. So we know that it's not immune to the health of the economy, but we also know from, from the historical pattern that it's not all about the economy. This is a little demographic chart to just to make one point. It's good to focus on 25 to 54-year-old men, because that eliminates the problem of baby boomers aging. But 
in that category of men, 25 to 54, they're getting older on average. And if you look at the 35 to 44-year-old yep. bracket, where there's a very high la highest labor force participation, that represents less of this age cohort. So it's, it's really important to think about demographics when you're doing this. The 25 to 54-year-old category takes care of most of it, but not all of it. <coughs> now, what's going on? Just a couple of observations. One is, something is, uh, American manufacturing has changed. As you know, we're producing a lot of stuff, but with fewer workers. These were the jobs that you could get with muscle and not brains. It's now very hard to get a factory job without some kind of education, some kind of computer skills. So that's clearly, there's something going on there. That doesn't mean, and I'm sure Nick agrees with me, we're not gonna bring, we're not, we don't, we will not, and we don't wanna bring back manufacturing to the 1950s. There, there are reasons that we've made progress with productivity, but we have to think about how this affects prime age men. Secondly, when you look at the question about is it demand or supply, you can ask this question. If there was a shortage of unskilled men willing to work, their wages would be going up. What do we see? This is the ratio of high school wages. These are high school grads. He was showing you high school dropouts. These are high school grads to college wages. You can see that relative to college wages, high school wages are going down. That's part of the argument that this is something about demand. So technology and globalization have changed the nature of the workplace in ways that do not favor lesser educated men who are more, high, more likely to be in this pool. And finally, uh, this is just another chart from a recent Hamilton Project report. I didn't realize that Nick was going to show. This arrest and this incarceration thing is really important. And <coughs> incarceration is, coincides with education. On the left, you see that if you're a high school dropout of any race, higher for blacks than whites, though, you're more likely to be have had an incarceration. These are people, I think, between, uh, can't read it, but in, in, I think these are people in their 30s, right? It's most likely. It yeah. Like 30, so you 30, can just 34. see that uh, these people have a double whammy, at least. They are not, they don't have skills in education that the workforce demands, and then a higher proportion of them have this um, disadvantage. And finally, I just couldn't resist, this is a fantastic paper that Alan Kruger yes. has done recently, where based on survey evidence, he asked about uh, these men, uh, who are not in the workforce about whether they were in pain, and lots of them say they were in pain. This one shows whether they took pain medication. As you can see, uh, the blue line is uh, men, the gray line is women. The fraction that 43.5% of the men <coughs> who are not in the labor force had taken pain medication the previous day, two thirds of them a prescription drug. So we, we don't, as Nick said, we don't really know what's cause and effect. But we know from the work of Case and Deaton and, and Raj Chetty that there's something going on, opioid addiction with white working class men. And it's no, it can't be any accident here that uh, we see this pattern of more likely to be on pain meds, whether to cause you not to work or because you're not working than if you were in the labor force. So uh, I'll leave it there. Again, I want to remind people who are watching online that you can send a uh, question to S L I, that's Sam Larry Iris dot D O, David o Oscar, and enter it. Uh, the code is AEI event. And you can send a question, and if I can remember to look at the iPad, I, I might ask it. So, Nick, <coughs> let's talk a little bit about the supply and demand thing. Yes. Where do you, why do you think it's so much more supply than, say, Jason Furman and the CEA? Um. I guess I think I think that it is more supply than Jason and the CEA in their excellent report. By the way, they deserve a huge salute for putting this on Washington's agenda. There are very few in uh, the administration or in the Congress who have done, I think, as much to put this on the agenda as they. Um, it's really a question, I think, of the proportions, whether we're talking about uh, demand 70% uh, demand or demand 40%. Um, I tend to think that, uh, I tend to think that, um, that both the institutional barriers have been severely underestimated. This That's is incarceration. This is the incarceration and its incarceration felony, the criminalization of a large proportion of American population, obviously mostly younger men. I think that's been severely uh, underestimated, in part because the government kind of forgot to collect the information which would allow us to examine this. 
and I also think that the uh, I think that the supply aspect has also been uh, to some degree understated or underestimated in the uh, in the general narrative because I don't think that most of the general work has um, actually taken a uh, a, a comprehensive look at the role of disability programs in the overall tableau. Um, I can understand why there's been a certain amount of oversight there. Um, we do not have any central government authority c to collect information on all of the crazy quilt of programs that we have in the disability area. That's why Jason's excellent report the CEA report focused on one program in particular, SSDI. They concluded that this maybe didn't have such a big role because only 28 percent of uh, uh, the men not in labor force were enrolled in that one program. Uh, I think what I show in my book is that the overall proportion is actually well over half if you take into account SSI, veteran disability, the other programs that people report being part of, it's a much bigger aspect. Um, we get into questions about reservation wages and things like that as well, and I think that those are actually kind of, those are quite complex to research. Uh, it's quite complex actually to try to answer those in a methodologically rigorous way. But, um, but I would say for the reasons that I mentioned already and for some other reasons I mentioned in the book as well, uh, the notion that this is overwhelmingly a demand problem I think needs some re-examination. So when you say supply problem, you mean something there is that's keeping these guys from even bothering to look for jobs? Well, let me give you some examples, David. Um, we know in general that the, well, a pool of seven million men has got pretty much some of everybody, right? right. Yeah. Um, but we know overrepresented are men with lower education, African American men, native born American men, and men who have never been married or don't have kids, uh, kids at home. Um, those are the overall patterns, but there are some striking uh, irregularities in the patterns. For example, if you're a black guy and you're married, you're more likely to be in the labor force than a white guy who isn't married. So, uh, so with that respect, marriage trumps ethnicity. Um, if you are uh, foreign born and you, uh, and you have no high school uh, diploma, your profile looks like a, uh, like a college grab. So uh, nativity or immigration trumps, uh, you know, uh, trumps education in that particular case. Um, there are enough of these irregularities to suggest that, uh, th that the motivational aspect uh, may have been neglected in much of the work, I think, that has been done so far. So when you go to, I think the demand supply, which in some cases, as you sort of hinted at, is a bit artificial because if I tell you if I raised wages at the bottom, yep. if I doubled the earned income tax credit, yep. and I pulled some of these men off the sidelines, but I also made them more attractive to employers, it's a little hard to know yes. where it is, what's the supply and what's the right. demand, but your diagnosis does influence what you think the policies are. So is if you were thinking about how to attack yep. this problem, mm -hmm. what would you be on your list? Well, um, in, in the book, I'm pretty light on policy prescriptions, in part because I don't want to uh, be seen as trying to Bigfoot this thing. Uh, in my view, we need to have voices from all over the political spectrum come in from very different points of view so that we can build a sustainable consensus, having all sorts of different viewpoints say this is important, don't let it uh, get forgotten about. Where I come from, uh, I, I suggest in this book three kind of uh, areas for investigation. Uh, one is uh, trying to reinvigorate business and particularly smaller businesses so that for more job generation. I think that probably wins on its own merits, but I think as you know very much better than I from your work, we've had a, a net business death environment since 2007, more businesses closing than opening. That can't be good in all sorts of different ways. Um, I suggest in the book that we should look at uh, 
a serious overhaul of our disability programs. The, uh, obviously, we need to have some sort of disability uh, guarantees and insurance for society. That's why the programs are there. But we also want to make sure that the unintended consequences of the programs aren't uh, enormous and perverse. And I think we can argue they may be today. Uh, the sort of uh, the sort of direction that I think we might talk about actually is something that we see in Sweden. Uh, you heard it first here, an AEI guy talking about the Swedish <laughs> model. Uh, but it, to the it, left of Brookings, just proving left, my point. What's going on today? Um, in Sweden today, uh, some of the aspects of their employment policies are kind of like work first. Uh, they're heavy on training and skills. They incentivize uh, showing up for job placement. They incentivize showing up for work. Uh, if we take a look at the welfare reform in the 1990s, um, I think in retrospect we'd say that was fairly successful. Someone can say, Eberstadt, you idiot, don't you realize we had a good economy in the 90s and it stinks now? Uh, fair enough. But there's been uh, actually very interesting work done uh, in the Brookings papers on the, uh, on the parsing of the impact of the welfare reform and the macroeconomic environment, according to some of that work, was actually a rather smaller part than the changes in incentives. And the last part I'd uh, emphasize is we, it's just a scandal that we don't collect data on the social and economic circumstances of the 20 million Americans who have got some sort of a felony uh, in their past but are not behind bars. Uh, if, we, if we are a forgiving society, and I think we are, I hope we are, uh, part of what we should want to be doing is figuring out how we can get uh, these ex-felons back into the economy and back into society. We can't have evidence-based policies unless we have the evidence. And that also, I think, is absolutely critical for the future. So I, um, there are people here who know more than I I think there is the beginnings of some research agenda on this yep. felony thing, and there's yep. some really interesting going work on inside and outside the government. Yes. I think that's one where I'm sure you'd agree there's been an enormous focus, bipartisan really, one of the few bipartisan things about that we realize that this is, has consequences that were not foreseen when we decided to put so many people in jail. Let me go back to your first thing. So you do agree that um, if we're going to, we could wiggle around this line with, with demand. Mm -hmm. And so if we had a stronger economy with more job creation, more of these people would sure. be working. And so Always good. it's a good thing. Um, on, the, on the disability, I think that um, there's... Uh, been a lot of discussion about reform of the disability thing. Not all of it is work first. I mean, uh, the business about do we, should we find a way to give employers incentives so that they keep people on the job rather than put them on disability. We have a system where once you go on disability, you never get off. We discourage people from, if they apply for disability, from even looking for a job, because if you look for a job while you've applied, then they say you don't need the yeah. thing. So um, I think that's another area, and partly because of the SSDI trust fund always yes. being on the edge, that yes. there's been some work, although um, uh, th th this work and recommendations are uh, uh, necessary, but clearly not sufficient condition for it. Somebody uh, wrote in a question, which I hear a lot too, and which I want you to speak to, which is, so are these guys getting pushed out of the job market because the women are coming in? <clears throat> uh, between 1948 and the year 2000, in response to this absolutely critical question, uh, the work rate for America as a whole rose as the work rate for American women soared. Uh, what this means, of course, is that American women were not displacing men. They were supplementing men. It was kind of a win-win situation. Uh, what we have seen since uh, the year 2000 is a gruesome parallel decline in work rates for men and women. So I don't think it's an either or with women eating men's lunches as we sometimes hear in certain uh, circles. It's been, a, it's been a pretty grim economy for working women for the last 15 or 16 years. Right, well. so the labor force participation rate participation rate of prime age women rose steadily until like the late 90s, it yep. leveled off and now it started yep. to decline. And yeah, the, the, uh, I was talking in particular about the work rate, but that's, uh, it's also true about the labor right. force participation rate. 
So when you make, when you look at that chart, your spaghetti chart with lots of different colors, yep. uh, um, what do you make of the fact, what conclusion do you draw from the fact that we seem to have a more severe problem here? Well, um, we're not the, I mean, how to start. Almost every society, almost every affluent industrial democracy has seen some decline, at least some decline, in labor force participation rates for prime age guys over the last 50 years. Um, that seems to be worldwide. Um, we have suffered a much more severe decline than any other industrial democracy. Now, I wouldn't say that that's because we are necessarily more globalized or we are necessarily more outsourced, although maybe we could prove that we are. Um, if you take a look at uh, other countries, and I'm thinking off the top of my head of Sweden and France and Canada and Australia, they experience just about identical declines in their proportion of manufacturing jobs as we did over a period from like 1970 to the present. Um, and yet we are the country that had the most dismal uh, record with the exit of men from the labor force altogether. Certainly, uh, certainly it's logical and I think um, quite evident that the big structural change in manufacturing is part of this problem but I don't think it, think it explains why the United States ended up at the bottom of the barrel, not that part. So, well, I think there are a couple of possibilities. One is there are policies that these other countries use that we don't, mm -hmm. that it, yep. this is actually optimistic because mm -hmm. it means there are things we yep. could do. Um, we also know that the gap between wages at the top and the bottom yep. has widened more here mm -hmm. than other places. Mm -hmm. So it's consistent with the notion that wages at the bottom are so unattractive that they're not enough to get guys off the couch, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, oh, absolutely. And with the, uh, of course, uh, measuring, uh, measuring the impact of wages at the very lowest level, I mean the, uh, the minimum wage uh, level, gets to be a little bit more complex because of the various social benefits, trying to calculate the exact, uh, exact take-home uh, in effect is a little bit more complicated, but as a general proposition, right. for sure. The, so you showed that interesting chart of the disparities among the states. Yes. You, uh, is that more of a question than a hypothesis? Well, uh, here's one, one of the sets of ingredients, I think, for connecting those dots, at least uh, to m my eyes, uh, as a Rorschach test for Nick. Um, one of the things that we know about disability benefits um, as opposed to uh, some other sorts of benefits, is that they may tend to tie you to your locality. Um, that's also true with uh, SNAP and some other sorts of benefits. Um, it, is, it is at least worth considering whether the nature of our uh, social benefit programs may have had the perverse effect of uh, helping to tether people to low job environments when they would be better served through mobility. It, certainly it is the case whether this, uh, whether this social welfare anchor is actually in effect or not. Certainly it is the case that geographic mobility has plummeted in the United States over the past 35 years. And that in itself is consistent with the big increases, I think, in disparities uh, between the states. So there's nothing to stop you from taking your SSDI or veterans benefits from Maine to New Hampshire or to Florida. Yeah. Right? They're not, it's not like, uh, it's not a, there, but there might be differences about the way the states I, administer I, I, that. I, I, th I think that because they're administered at the local level, there's a, a certain amount of barriers to uh, start up and so forth there. Um, because they are uh, administered in the local manner. Hmm. But I suppose you could also look at, you know, questions of wages yes. and wages mm -hmm. at the bottom and whether mm -hmm. there's a difference there. For sure. Um, uh, so did the, did the changes to uh, the welfare system in the 90s, you know, all the requirements of work and all that stuff, does that does that, would that have, much, have had much impact on the behavior of these prime age men? Well, in the, in the 1990s, um, 
I mean, they wouldn't have been. They wouldn't uh, have been getting it yeah, anyway. Yeah, they right? wouldn't have been getting it anyway. It was a, it was a sort of a uh, what would you say? It was a sort of controlled experiment uh, which mainly uh, involved uh, mothers of children right. who didn't right. have uh, who weren't married. One of the interesting things you said, and I think it's it's really important to point out to people, is, you know, it would be nice if there were a bunch of men who decided not to work and decided to stay home and cook and clean because their wives had such good jobs. But it seems to me in your book you point this out two things. First of all, these men who aren't in the labor force, who aren't even looking for work, don't tend to be married anyways, perhaps because you don't make a very attractive husband if you have no job, no income. Um, and secondly, the time use studies don't show that these guys are actually spending a lot more time on chores around the house or stuff. There's, there really is, to the extent that you can trust these time use stories, a lot of screen time, younger men on video games, uh, older men on TV. So the kind of, wouldn't it be nice if yeah. stories don't seem to hold up very well? Well, I mean, of, of course, I think it was uh, Dr. Uh, Gregory House, MD, who told us that everybody is a liar. Um, but if you take a look at these surveys and you have them as, their, as your first kind of uh, go-to, uh, the, the picture is pretty dispiriting. Uh, as you say, David, there's not a lot of uh, civil society. There's not even a lot of help around the house. There is a lot of sitting and watching and what is called uh, uh, socializing, uh, relaxing, and leisure. Um, one of the things which is really uh, noteworthy about the U.S. labor market in the post-war era is the large number of people who left the labor market for a number of years and then returned successfully later on. Uh, those tens of millions of people were generally called women, and most of them, I think, were probably called mothers. Now, whatever else you say about a mother who is at home, uh, she is almost never idle. Uh, she has to be uh, dependable, she has to be there, there are no uh, sick days, uh, you have to keep a schedule. All of these sorts of things, you, if you look at them as skills, are the sorts of things that employers uh, tend to like in, uh, in their employees. Uh, we have to ask the question about what happens to the guys in this neat group, neither in education, neither in employment nor education or training, after a year or two of being out of the labor force? Um, how do employers look at them and their uh, their skills? So your solution largely, we want to tweak the benefit programs uh, to make to create more incentives for work. You're not against uh, trying to run a hotter economy or raging raising raising the wages of people at the bottom, but you're a little skeptical about whether that's really the bulk of the problem. Is that fair? Yeah, I, th I think that's fair to say. And um, mainly what, I'm, uh, what I try to say at the end of this book is that it's important for people with all sorts of different policy agendas to come into the public square and to agree with one another that we need to shine a spotlight on this. Uh, I mean, we can... You know, we can duke it out in the world of empirical effects to see what actually works and doesn't work. But if we let this problem uh, slip back into the shadows, um, it's going to certainly continue, and I think we've got uh, all sorts of reasons to worry that it's going to get even worse than this. And what are the consequences of it getting worse or not getting any better? Um, well, let's see. Um, slow economic growth. Uh, widening wealth and income disparities, greater government dependence, uh, bigger budget deficits, bigger debt, um, more pressure on fragile families, less social mobility, uh, less social capital, uh, weaker civil society. I mean, there's absolutely nothing good that and maybe comes out more of that. opioid addiction. And maybe more opioid addiction. And I, I myself will not connect these dots, but I think it's possible to talk about increasing political extremism in the United States. It's really hard to figure out for me to figure out what's cause and what's effect here. Uh, if you're if you lost your job, you can't get another one. You didn't look very hard. Moving is kind of hard. You get discouraged. You get angry, um, you know that that it, you may become one of your yeah. supply side stories, but it started with you lost your job. On the other hand, if you have all these guys uh, 
and many of them who basically never had a, a, a solid job, uh, who have found some way to get by mooching off of their family or whatever, uh, um, and then that leads to some of these, uh, making them unattractive to employers. It's just, it's really hard for me to tease out, and I don't think the data gives us the answer, which one of these is a consequence of not having a job and which one is having is a cause of not having a job. Well, I, 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 take, I take your point, I take your point, but, the, but this is why we need to make this uh, a bipartisan, or if you will, an omnipartisan uh, point of concern and why we can't, uh, can't forget about it in three months or in a year when the economy seems to be going uh, tepidly well. Hmm. So uh, I'm only, yeah, there's a question back there. I think there's a mic and wait for the mic so the TV cameras can help and be sure to tell us who you are and remember that it'd be good to ask a question, not make a speech. Right. Robert Shredda with International Investor. Uh, thanks very much. I think this is great insight. Uh, there's some figures we've been seeing, one of them showing that it's not just the lowest educated, but also college education, uh, at least males in the prime age are starting to have increasing problems relocating and finding jobs. And my specific question is, ha have you looked at the, the other interesting figure we see in all this is the number of jobs and even careers that the average person will go through by the time they are reaching the end of their working age life. Um, we understand that there's an increase in the number of jobs. Now, some look at that as job mobility, others look at it as insecurity. But uh, did you look at that at all in terms of uh, how many times people are forced to change jobs or do so willingly over the course of a career? We think it's a measure more of instability. Um, in, in my study, I, I've got a chapter, chapter five, which looks at the demography of the unworking American man mainly the, this group of seven million between the ages of 25 and 54 were neither working nor looking for work. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the high school dropouts account for a disproportionate share of this group, but they still only account for about one-fifth. Uh, American guy, well, guy, guys of all backgrounds, with some college or more, with at least a little college, or maybe more than a little college, account for not quite half, but over 40%. So it's a non-trivial aspect of this, uh, of this greater, uh, greater phenomenon. I mean, I think, that, I think that there's a fair amount of work that has been done that is suggesting actually that the churning in the labor market has been going down, not up, and that the uh, that the decline in churning may actually be something that we uh, need to be a little bit worried about. I know, David, you may have uh, some. Oh, I think mean, that's right. I th you know, the, uh, it, it, it is, it, I think it's true that technology and globalization are changing over the people's lifetime. So pe there are people whose jobs, are no, they can no longer do the job they did because the job has changed. But on the macro level, there's fewer, there's less of this people moving. So uh, uh, changing jobs than there was, and that's, a, that's one of the explanations that economists offer for the slowdown in productivity growth. Um, uh, somebody wrote in and asked about whether you think there's a reluctance of people who maybe once had a factory or blue collar construction job to go work in a Walmart or a nursing home, that there's some, I don't know, self-respect or stigma associated and that that's part of this. That's a very good question, and I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer this question as a numbers nerd. Um, I think that we need um, uh, a poet laureate more like a J.D. Vance or somebody like that who can get at some of the humanity in this uh, great saga to describe this uh, better. What I can tell you from uh, looking at the statistics is that only about one in seven of the, uh, of this if you want to call it, this army of seven million men, uh, report that they are out of the labor force because uh, they could not find a job. Uh, six out of seven give other reasons there. Uh, a lot of the reasons are disability. Uh, 
I mean, and, um, and David, uh, David described uh, some of the truly grim new findings about, uh, about pain pills. Um, I mean, the, uh, the vision of people sitting in front of screens uh, on pain pills all day is really pretty dispiriting. Mm. Uh, gentleman in the back there. Yeah, the guy with the blue shirt, and yeah, it's you, and then pass it to Bob when you're. Dr. Eberstadt, George Pendleton. Um, two point question as it relates to remedies for this. It has been shown through several studies that if employers were to hire for skill as opposed to credential, there would probably be, be a 30% increase, particularly among underrepresented minorities in the workforce. So my question to you is twofold. One, um, would you advocate possibly a discussion of amending the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to prohibit discrimination in employment based on credentials? Mm. And secondly, at what point in time, given your graphs, do you think the trajectory of your graphs becomes a homeland security threat? Mm. Wow, those are two yes or no questions. Nice, easy questions. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm I'm a bit out of my depth in dealing with uh, with the Civil Rights Act. When I, when I think about uh, discrimination against minorities, the first thing I think of through this study has to do with uh, the felony background and criminal record and the overrepresentation of some minorities in this pool. I don't think that we actually know as much as we need to about why people who have a record of some sort in their past aren't in the labor force as much as I think they should be. Uh, is it because of discrimination, pure and simple, and barriers? Is it because people lose skills while they're in stir? Is it because people who are, uh, tend to have trouble with the law also are the sort of people who employers tend not to look for? I think we can know a lot more about that than we do. And I think we should. Uh, and if the government were to collect data on this rather than for us to rely upon a couple of surveys, we'd know an awful lot more. Um, as, to, um, as to when this becomes a sort of a crisis that our um, uh, policing authorities uh, have to pay attention to, uh, I would submit that your guess is at least as good as mine. Um, things, are, things are going in a uh, direction which does not look at all good. Larry Summers, in a uh, blog of his a couple of weeks ago, uh, just extrapolated the line out to the 2040s and the 2050s. I don't know if we can really do that, but if you do that, you've got a really uh, spooky two-tier society staring you in the face. Uh uh, Bob Samuelson, can you raise your hand so they can go behind you? Bob, wave your hand. Uh, Bob Samuelson, The Washington Post. Uh, how are these guys supporting themselves? Is it just a disability program, patchwork of disability programs or whatever? Or, uh, you know, where do they get their meals every day? I've got a, Bob, I've got a chapter in this book, chapter eight, which tries to, tries to parse some of that out. I don't think I'm totally successful because I don't think that the, um, that the Census Bureau's um, CPS statistics uh, fully, um, fully reflect the benefits uh, that, uh, that people around the country are getting. It's not a crime. Uh, CPS also way underrepresents capital gains and things like that. Uh, as far as I can make out from looking at the income and the spending statistics, which are done uh, by Census on the one hand and the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Expenditure Survey on the other hand, it's, um, it's it's to some degree uh, moonlighting, but to a very, very small degree moonlighting. That's not a major source of income. It's uh, above that is government benefits, disability benefits, and means-tested benefits. And above that, uh, relying upon uh, the resources of your family, uh, friends, girlfriends, your relatives. Um, when it comes to actual spending patterns, um, non-working men, 
and that includes the unemployed. Unfortunately, we can't parse out the unworking and the unemployed. The difference being unemployed means you're looking, looking for, for work. You're, 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 you're out of a job looking for work as opposed to out of a job not looking for work. About three quarters of the guys are in the latter category, so it's predominantly them. Um, their spending patterns, not surprisingly, are lower than the national average, but interestingly enough, they're not in the bottom quintile of spending for America. They're in the next quintile, the second quintile. Um, they're not living like kings, but they're not at the bottom. Who's at the bottom? Single mothers, female-headed households. Uh, the guys who are in this group are more or less ironically in the incomes, uh, in the spending stratum, the living standards uh, stratum, which uh, one day long ago we might have uh, attributed to the working class. But I'm sure you would agree that we have to take all these numbers with a, a, oh, yeah. a great deal of skepticism, and it's the kind of question yeah. that is probably best answered not by mm -hmm. responses to the Consumer Expenditure Survey, but by a much more kind of sociological, anthropological, living Absolutely. in the community and interviewing you know, people. And I'm so gl I'm so glad you mentioned that because you know uh, about a mile from here. Uh, back in the 60s, there was an anthropologist named Elliot Lebo who did a beautiful ethnography study about black Washington called Tally's Corner. Uh, it, it has withstood the test of time, and in all sorts of qualitative ways, it gets at things that people just can't get at with, uh, with statistics and commas and uh, you know, decimal points. Um, we need to have a whole bunch of Elliot Lebos go out and give us the, hum the human dimensions of this crisis we have in America today. Well, why don't I take a couple of questions? We get more. There's a woman in the back, and then there's a couple up here uh, in the red. And I'll take. I'm going to take all three of you, and then we'll let. We're going to take a four questions, and then then. Uh, Nick can decide which one he wants to answer. Hi, Lisa Ekman with the National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives, and I have two very quick questions, I think. One is, um, you mentioned the impact that incarceration has on um, imp uh, participation in the labor force. Did you take a look at the overrepresentation of people with disabilities who are incarcerated? So for example, about 40% say um, of, of people who are incarcerated also have a disability. So the overlap of those could could be telling as to what the story is. The second is when you look and make international comparisons and we're doing much worse, um, do you take a look at the fact that in other countries, people who become unemployed have access to better job training, they have access to, um, they have universal health care, they have universal access to long-term services and supports and rehabilitation that can help them <coughs> maintain labor force attachment. Right, thanks. And, and we don't hear. Right, why don't we come up here? I'm going to get these three guys to ask a question, and we'll let Nick respond. Uh, can we have the mic over here? Uh, the guy in the blue shirt, raise your hand so the mic lady can see you. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Yarrow with the Aspen Institute, and a couple of comments, questions. Um, the first, in this whole supply versus demand argument, supply in a way could be read as culture, and I've seen these Pew and other surveys that will show, that have shown that women are willing to take jobs that men won't take. And you know, some of that may be wages. Women are willing to take bad jobs that men might not take, which you'd alluded to before. But you know, and perhaps some of that can be gotten to with higher wages. But I'd be interested in your thoughts of to what extent this is part of a larger cultural failing men uh, kind of problem. I mean, you talk about failing boys in schools, lower college participation. And the one other question, you look at the 25 to 54 prime age, of course, once you get to older men, you're seeing increased labor force yes. participation. And I'd be interested in what yes. you make of that. OK, thanks. Uh, I'm Steve Powell, uh, Sino Powell Capital. Uh, you all know what capital is. I'm Powell. Sino means China. And I don't see a lot of these problems in China. And, and going to this gentleman's um, comment about enabling people to be unemployed and not look for work, 
They're supported by their families, but they're also supported by the government. Has there been any research on uh, the effect of getting these men to return to the workforce when their subsidies from the government have been reduced or cut out? Okay, and Larry? And that's a good segue into my question, because have you given any thought to uh, what a universal basic income policy would have on this? Uh, okay, these are really good questions. So the first one was, is there some overlap between people being incarcerated and disability, do we know? Um, I say, I argue in this book, this is something we desperately need to know about. We don't have nearly as much information on this as we should. We desperately need to know about that. Well, when we talk about men who are not in the labor force, the government statistics generally don't count people who are incarcerated. No. It's the civilian non-institutional population. That's right. But at this point, uh, 10 times as many people, people are in, ex, yeah, yeah. Are, 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 uh, have felonies at large in society as are behind bars. Okay. So other countries have different and often bigger social safety nets, yes. more active labor market policies. Is that one reason why they're doing better than we are? Um, I, th I think that certainly some aspects of that are involved. I mean, I think certainly uh, you can make the case that training policies and uh, uh, policies in particular countries which are, uh, which are involved in trying to up people's skills and get people back into the labor market, they, uh, those things I think are very much worth looking at. Uh, one difference is that it is it is more characteristic in European countries to have larger unemployed uh, populations than in the United States. So whereas we have people who are not in the labor force at all, many European countries tend to have a shift towards more unemployed than not in labor force. And do you think it's better? It's, it's a, there's an advantage to having people who see themselves as unemployed who are at least going through the motions of looking at work than not being in the labor force and not even... I mean, I think one certainly can make that argument. People will, dis will disagree about that, but that's certainly an argument that can be. Um, so Andrew Yarrow basically asked, is this just one more symptom of the end of man or something? Um, well, well I, I, think that if you, I think if you take a look into the, uh, into the pool of unworking men, you do see different sorts of uh, motivational factors, call them values, call them aspirations. I mean, I think it's... I think it's really meaningful that you have such a difference with respect to family structure, with respect to people who are people who are married are making different choices from people who are not married in very large numbers and probabilities. Likewise, people who take the risk of coming to the United States are making very different sorts of um, calculations from people who are born here. So. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not Spenglerian. Uh, I, I think there's probably a lot more hope than just, uh, just saying that it's culture. And of course, the other thing is, once you say it's all culture, you know, that's kind of like, it's a big thing, and it, it's kind of like, well, we can't talk about that. I think we can talk about this. What do you make of the increase in labor force participation of older men? Um, and, women, and, and women, too. Um, I, I think it's terrific. Um, I think it's really the single uh, glimmer of sunshine that we see in the labor market over the past 25 years, this turn up for the 55 plus group. I mean, it's what should happen with a more educated, more healthy American population. So maybe when all these guys turn 56, they'll go to work? Well, if you look at Jason and the CEA's work on the age, uh, cohort by cohort, right. um, we'd have to live in a lot of hope to yeah, look for right. that. Um, uh, so there were two questions which are actually uh, yin and yang questions. One is, well, should we just cut these guys' subsidy off? They have to work. And then there's the other is, well, if they're not going to get work, wouldn't we be better off giving them a universal basic income? So at least they're not starving, mooching off their relatives or breaking into well, um, prevalent farms. Yeah. Well, well uh, hard-hearted uh, as I am, I think that I think we've got some other options from the total uh, the total Darwinian option. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, if we were to overhaul programs uh, to put incentives in place and also maybe even some uh, some help for training and for job placement, that might work uh, work even better than Oliver Twist. Uh, I think we. Uh, I think there are all sorts of reasons to hope that this might uh, might be better. Um, 
the, pro, the, the situation that we have now is just pretty perverse, so it's a question of how we change it to make it better. We, I think we also need to go back and take a closer look at what actually happened in the 1990s with the welfare reform for single mothers. That would be the sort of uh, the example of something that, uh, against what many people saw as all odds, actually seems to have worked in practice. Uh, single mothers and NILF men are not the same but we, we might want to look back at that. And quickly, universal basic income. Uh, my, uh, my friend and colleague Charles Murray will tell you that's the way to go. Um, if you think that there is something valuable in the vocation of work per se, you'll get a different argument there. And that's something that I'd argue with my friend and colleague about. So we promised to end directly at four and we're right on time. I want to thank everybody for participating and the people who asked questions online, I didn't get to all of them, but I got to most. And uh, the, one of the advantages of this book is unlike a lot of books that are written in Washington, this one's really it's thin, little. so it's you really can little. actually read it. Um, uh, and so I, I commend it to all of you. And thank you all for coming. And in. thank you, David.